Good afternoon, and thanks all for coming out for the finalist presentations of the Wheelwright Prize. 2016, I should say, right? Um, I want to spend just a few minutes, I need to say something about the prize itself. I know a lot of you know very well about the Wheelwright Prize, which is a very old prize. Then I'll introduce the finalists uh, for this year, and then we'll hear presentations from each of the finalists, um, followed by a sort of round table uh, discussion. Um, so thanks again for coming out. Um, in 1935, the family of the GSD alumnus, Arthur Wheelwright, endowed a traveling fellowship for a single student from the GSD, which was then a school of architecture um, only, uh, and it was to be a grand tour experience uh, in the tradition of the Beaux-Arts grand tour where the student would travel inevitably to Europe, uh, to Italy even, um, uh, and, and, and it was at a time when international travel, especially from America, was actually quite rare. And it was considered, in a way, essential if you were going to be a truly great architect that you have this travel. Previous winners included William Worcester, who went on to be this great educator on the uh, East and West Coast, Elliot Noyes, um, I am Pei, Paul Rudolph, there are many, many others. Uh, that you can imagine, as well as, as, as was pointed out in conversation, m many students who also didn't get it, that, that went on to great accomplishments. But it was an important prize. Um, it was relaunched uh, by, by Mosin and in the, in the school in 2013. It's an altogether new conception for the prize. Now it would be open to support exceptional um, early career architects who needed and deserved the time and space to create and ex execute long-term research projects. And of course, research is one of the things that this school has become very, very important recently. But wh what we were looking for in the Wheelwright Prize, in this new design of the Wheelwright Prize, was research projects not that were adjunct or in addition to an architectural practice, but rather an architectural practice which was itself a mode of research. And I think the, 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 the finalists you'll see today and the finalists you've seen in past years in this uh, new relaunched um, conception uh, em emphasize that. This is our fourth cycle in the new um, conception of it. Every year we, we received for, for four years about 400 applications from around the world. We actually, the jury actually go, uh, there's, a, there's an initial screening, and usually about half of those, about 200 applications, um, are looked at by the jury. Uh, this year, they came from 50 countries world, worldwide. Previous winners um, have been Gia Wolf, a, a, Har a GSD alum of 2000, and she won the prize in 2013. Jose Ajeda uh, in 2014, and Eric LaRue in, uh, just last year. In, um, oh, I also want to mention that, especially in 2015, when was the first year that we invited multiple finalists to present. We, last year we invited three finalists to present. And just to mention that Malkit Shoshan, um, who was one of the finalists, uh, is, is now in New York. Recently, her project that she presented for the Wheelwright Prize um, was, was shown again at the Dutch Pavilion, uh, in, uh, or will be shown in the Dutch Pavilion at the next uh, Venice Biennale. So my, my point is that these, these, even these presentations already, in some cases, begin or launch um, a research project even for the, the finalists who don't win. And similarly, Quinn Van Tu, uh, an artist in London, has had multiple shows that included her wheelwright uh, proposals. Um, just want to mention this, this year's jury, Ava French from uh, Storefront in, uh, in New York, um, and Rafael Moneo, who unfortunately couldn't be here, um, Kiel Mo, who is here, Jeannie Kim, uh, an alum and herself a wheelwright, wheelwright prize winner, Ben Prosky, many of you of course know Ben now at the Center for Architecture in New York, uh, Mosin and myself, those were the jurors. So what, I, what I'd like to do is, I'm going to go ahead and do a very brief introduction because the bibliographies, the extended bibliographies are, 
uh, available on web and, and, and in posters and things outside. I want to introduce all the candidates in alphabetical order and then we'll hear presentations from each of them and then, and then a round table. And I, and I do want to keep this informal and discursive and, and um, yeah, easy. Well, not easy, but. Um, Sem <laughs> Semio Bravo uh, of, of Semio Bravo Arquitecto and is uh, from Santiago, Chile. Um, he's an architect who's worked, though, in a variety of contexts in South America, from, from Patagonia to the Amazon, developing the relationships, and this will be also his research project, between traditional building practices and contemporary architectural production. But it's more specific in that. He's particularly interested in the uh, traditional and often endangered architectures along the great hydrographic basins, or these giant uh, basins in South America, the Amazon being the largest of, of the, that where, where drainage um, uh, takes place and where very particular architectures and very particular cultures arise from the um, sort of ecosystems of these basins. So he'll be exploring uh, and will explain his exploration of the link between those traditional architectures and contemporary architectural production. Matilda Cassani from Milan, Italy. Uh, and I should mention uh, the, the, the um, the time of the degrees as well. It, it, to the, the finalists all have to have professional degrees in, in architecture. Uh, and, 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 and I just think it's important to mention that, that uh, Samuel received his degree in 2009 from uh, uh, the, the Pontifical Catholic University of, of Chile. Matilda Cassani graduated with the Bachelor of Architecture 2005 in Milan, and then went on to get a PhD uh, also from Milan. She directs her own practice in Milan, working in architecture, art, curatorial practices, installation, designs, as I hope we see. Matilda will be looking at uh, the architecture of pilgrimage sites and some of the work already that she's done in installations across, uh, across the world, including the United States, deals, I would say, with the, the, ritual, the rituals of, of space as much as the spaces of, of ritual, if I can say it that way. It, it, meaning that some of the, sometimes the equipment in the spaces, the, you know, the carpets, the, 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 the objects of worship, or gain architectural importance through the framing of the ritual um, itself at these pilgrimage sites. So, um, so we look forward to that. Um, Anna Pouginet uh, from Barcelona, um, graduated with the Bachelor of Architecture in 2004, also went on to do a PhD um, in, in, in Barcelona. She's the co-founder of MAIO, which is an architectural office in Barcelona, interested I would really in, in systems, flexible systems, but, but systems in general, systems that therefore include or accommodate architectures that are ad hoc, architectures that are ephemeral, architectures that change. And a proposal um, develops out of this expanded understanding of architectural systems to look at the domestic realm where certain um, necessary um, programmatic elements like the kitchen, perhaps like the bathroom, are not included in the domestic space directly, but can be accommodated by an expanded understanding of, of urban systems. So, so she calls it the kitchenless city, and we'll see examples of how by expanding the understanding of architecture to be a system rather than a thing, this idea of the kitchenless city uh, can be can be proposed, um, and then and then uh, finally Pierre Paolo, sorry Pierre Paolo uh, Tamburelli, um, founder of of Balcou Architects in Milan and Genoa, graduated from Genoa in um, 2002, and then an advanced degree uh, in 2004 from the Berlaga. Um, uh, Baku, you've you've seen uh, you'll recognize actually a number of. Uh, buildings of Baku, including the pavilion for the Shanghai Expo, the, the sorry, the, the Italian pavilion for the Shanghai Expo in 2010, and this, if I may say, extraordinary um, house of memory in Milan, which is a very recent project 
of, of 2015. Um, he will be looking at what he calls the one, the, the, uh, to, he will be researching to produce an atlas of the wonders of the world. And it involves, again, uh, sort of uh, um, contemporary, contemporary rituals, monuments, memorials um, that contribute to this idea of an unfolding of architecture um, that, again, have it, is, is shaped by the, the idea of, of, ritual, of ritualized occupation. So those are our four um, um, finalists. Can, can we welcome them as a school? And uh, um, and ask Samuel to come and begin the present presentations. Thank you. Well, hi, hi everyone. Thanks, Michael, for the presentation. I would also like to thank the Harvard GSD the opportunity of being here and sharing my work and the perspective of a possible architecture on the cultural friction conflict. My proposal, Cultural Frictions Towards a Transference from tra Traditional Architectures to the Contemporary Productions, aims to research endanger traditional architectures along three major hydrographic basins of the world, as well as a physical and meaningful relation of peoples with landscape. Looking through particular constructions of landscape, I will inquire how people deal with the friction of traditional spaces with modernity. I'm going to explain the part of the argument I'm, I'm showing over the next few minutes. Um, these are the steps of my own journey and the circle I'm, I'm willing to complete through this will read proposal. First, I'm going to present a work of Juan Downey, a Chilean architect that in the 70s approached the Yanomami people from the Amazon. Downey's work reveals through his own experience a meaningful relation of culture and landscape. I will analyze the, the work of Downey in so far as it suggests a perspective to my own work and this proposal. Following, I would like to share with you two experiences of my own work. Both of them represent an insight into a particular context. First, the experience of Tarapacá. I discovered this for the first time, traditional architectures as a set of values that we as architects could interpret as a strategy for the contemporary production. In the second case, I live with the Shipibo people of the Amazon. This allowed me to project over the ground of, tradi of a traditional architecture that contains a perfectly balanced relation with the elements of nature. Then I would like to propose a comment on what I learned from the traditional architectures and what I think are the challenges for a cultural space that ranges from the traditional environment to the peripheral slums in modern cities. Finally, I would like to describe the goals and itinerary of my wheelwright proposal to finish with the projections and challenges that it raises. In the 70s, Chilean architect and artist Juan Downey recorded the Yanomami people of the Amazon pioneering video art. This register gives an insight not only to the physical relation of people with landscape, but also shows the creation of the collective house, Shabono, as a meaningful display. Between November 1976 and May 1977, Downey lived with the Yanomami communities of Bishasi and Tayeri in the upper Orinoco River. Downey experienced himself the social structure of the Shabono and discovered in it a perfect instance of invisible, light, flexible, and economic architecture. This image shows the paradox of cultural friction an observer which is looking at his own reality and at the same time creating a new one mediated by a foreign world. This is what my Wilbert proposal is about. Architecture for the Yanomami has an elemental sense and it dwells not only the physical nature but also the supernatural way they perceive the world. The house encloses the quotidian space and concludes a cycle. Nature sorts and absorbs everything that happens in the house. Even the house itself is physically part of the place. Through some years practicing architecture, I've had the opportunity of approaching different regions of the South American context. It has been a journey that has shaped my vision of architecture itself 
and has raised my interest in, in the traditional habitat. So I would like to share with you uh, three experiences located in very different regions of South America that are somehow weaved in the relation of the architectural practice and the traditional construction of the built environment. In 2005, an earthquake devastated Tarapaca village in the Atacama Desert. Although very few people live there because of the depressed agricultural economy, the town takes a fundamental place in popular devotion. Its annual parade gathers 100,000 people from all over Atacama in a pilgrimage that transcends borders. It amazed me how a 70 town people turns into 100,000. The town is shaken from its lethargy and is brought back to life for a week a year. Every available space from the cemetery to the river esplanade is occupied by tents. When there is no more available room, the road is closed and, and vehicle stops going through. People begin to walk from the highway to the desert about the creek. The bands <coughs> play their marching tunes and the dancing brotherhoods perform their dances in honor to San Lorenzo, the patron saint of Tarabacá. Tarabacá village is the theater of this performance. Its square and streets are the space that shapes the saint's procession. This public space, shaped by a coherent collective creation, resulted disintegrated de by the earthquake. It was the non-monumental nature of heritage, the quotidian experience, the more difficult to rebuild. Um, here we see the damaged part of the edification in red and how this reconfigurates the public void of the town. As a group of students first, and uh, later architects, we were committed to the paradox of rebuilding from an irreplaceable story built over centuries by peoples and crafts long forgotten. We traveled and built along with the community. More than a singular project, our approach was to interpret heritage values as a set of abstract qualities that had to be drawn to the context of the contemporary production. The Tarabaca Group established a methodology based in, the, in research and survey of the entire town. We used every possible recording tool available from ethnographic narrations to habitability and climatic measurements of constructive systems. We discovered this strategy. Take heritage values present in the traditional architecture and deliver them to the community in the form of a game, a set of rules that anyone could follow to rebuild his own part of the town's private and public space. Uh, allow me to stop here for a while to mention my my fellow partners on, on this initiative, uh, Bernadita de Vilat, uh, Veronica Llanes, Natalia Sporke, Felipe Gram, Alvaro Silva, and a group that won the competition, which joined us in the enterprise. A modular solution based in a stable structural unit were then developed. With this system, we created a community project aimed to show an example that the community itself could replicate according to their particular needs. The culture house of San Lorenzo came to rebuild the old community house. The floor plan is organized the same way as Tarapaca houses, around the central corridor. The repetition of the structural module has a spatial consequence that interprets the thickness of the adobe wall, while at the same time reproduces its thermal mass. This mixed earthquake resistant system came to restore the damaged image of adobe in the eyes of the community. The roof uses cane shades, allowing the ventilation and projecting a light pattern over the inside. The space resembles the old shaded and vented houses, whose heavy adobe mass feels always fresh during the hot hours, while, while delivering the heat of the day in the cold nights. Traditional architectures are the support of daily activities. It responds genuinely to the life of a community. Here we see the, the opening of the, of the culture house with the, with the major and the community. Two years later, in 2009, a new project brought me to the Ucayali River Basin, in the center of the Peruvian Amazon. Professor Sandoit Riaga invited me to collaborate in Anini Shogo, a healing center based in the traditional medicine from the Shipibo people. 
In order to develop and build the project, I went to live with them. Then I saw the river droughts and floods that shaped the landscape. I sailed along the waterways that connect peoples and their economies, and experienced myself the wet heat and heavy rain. This is how I began to learn how to navigate this territory. The native Chipibo community of San Francisco region in Acocha is placed both physically and conceptually between the deep forests of the grandfathers and the bustling attractions of the nearby Pucalpa city. Ani Nishobu, big house of the forest in Chibibo language, is a healing center and reserve based on the plant medicine from the Chibibo people. To fit this extremely hot and wet climate, peoples from the Amazon have developed a simple yet specific set of rules, creating an architecture that embodies a traditional atmosphere. The Chibibo houses have tall roofs made out of palm leaves. Pronounced sleep favors the water runoff while the hot air is concentrated in the upper part of the volume, creating fresh and vented shades. Into this space, a deck that is both the floor and the table of the house, concentrates the quotidian activities, giving place to meals and long conversations accompanied by craft making. This is the role we found for our collective dining room, a big Shibibo house. The dining can be fully open or closed, yielding a continuous covered terrace with a vented envelope. <coughs> the project is based on the use of local research materials. The constructive logic was search in vernacular architecture so that it could be built by local craftsmen. The situation of trees, sites, and the ever-changing water levels were decisive to place the program. Covered outdoor margins create a shaded surround for habitations and an intermediate umbrella for the quotidian life. Walls themselves tend to merge with the roof or fade into a superposition of permeable screens. Rather than enclosed spaces, we were talking about built interiors. In 2013, raises the possibility of developing another project with the Shibibo community. Nihuinti, a home and, and school oriented towards the teaching of the traditional medicine from the Shipibo people based on the use of, of native plants. The plant medicine of the Shipibo people is in parallel. It's, it is an identitary value they feel proud about. They don't feel the same about traditional architectures. Here they feel poor and deprived of what they see as a better life. The effort that we're making is not about dignified precariousness, but about acknowledging what are truly remarkable environmental achievements from an elemental architecture, an architecture that is light, fresh, and can transform the materials of the immediate environment into a perfectly balanced relation with the elements of nature. In the case of Nikuinti, we define a cloak-like envelope, typical of the local Chevron palm constructions, but this time interpreted as a flexible shell modeled by a folding paper, a sort of parametric system available in any context. The structure is composed of a three-dimensional fold built on a system of two pieces that creates a triangulated mesh. The fabric's geometry is finally defined by setting the distance between vertices. The whole structure contributes to the generation of a light cover. This system is offered to become part of local practices, renewing traditional deep-rooted techniques and incorporating adjustments and adaptations of a new kind of craft. For the globally connect building industry, the immediate environment has been expanded, blurring that local condition. Architecture, nonetheless, embraces a bond with the context and maintains the search for a material and constructive identity. Cultural frictions involve a restructuration of the relation with the environment, tending to alter this balance through the replacement of materials and craft held by tradition. The dynamics of traditional architectures can nevertheless nourish and resignificate the urban context. Facing change, tra traditions can either evolve or be replaced. Evolution is therefore fundamental in the transmission of cultural features, and the continuity of knowledge has a close dependence on innovation. To newcomers, 
the face of growing cities are slums. Therefore, these are the interface of traditional space with modernity. One of the great challenges of the contemporary habitat is the uncontrolled growth of cities. This produces, in a spontaneous way, a built environment in a scale that greatly surpasses the reach of the architecture's planning and projecting tools. To tackle this issue, we must penetrate the dynamics of informal settlement creation, again composed of its own rules. The extinction of traditional environments and the race of the peripheral slum urban population are both part of the same circle. That is why I would like to stress the tension between these two polarities, emphasizing the collective process. What I would like to ask people living there is the same that Downey asked. Show me how to live the way that you do, so I can see the world through your understanding. The great hydrographic basins contains a natural diversity that has nourished primeval ways of inhabiting the territory. The itinerary of my research proposes the identification of geographic drivers that guide an approach to culture through territory. I choose three major drainage basins containing a rich cultural background, cost contrasting with, a grown, with growing modern cities. The case study methodology is composed of two parts. As a first step, I will register the settlements using graphical and spatial tools of analysis provided by our discipline, creating a survey that makes possible an understanding of communities and their respective landscapes. Then, a reflection in the form of architectural installations will emerge from the observed insights. What is to be created, built, or installed waits for the awakening of opportunity. Through these experiments, a spatial, material, or conceptual dimension of culture will be analyzed interacting with local communities. Well, as a first step, I would like to visit the Amazon Basin, in which I will visit the Ashanika communities of communal Ashanika Reserve near Park Otishi in the Eme River, Peru. I want to live among them and penetrate their territory by their paths and guidance. The urban areas of the region, the cities of Pucallpa and Atalaya, will offer a counterpoint to the forest communities. The, Chim the Shipibo community of Rio Pisqui, near the Cordillera Sul, maintains relations with the community of Yarina, <coughs> in which I live. The Pisqui community, nonetheless, lives in a much more isolated region, reached only by boat near the headwaters of the river. This trip completes a panorama of the Shipibo people, from their farthest expression to the urban condition. In the Congo River, I will travel across one of the world's greatest waterways and the fundamental connection to the Congolese territory. Here, I will visit two growing cities of the region, Kinshasa and Kinsangani. In 2025, Kinshasa will be Africa's largest city with 16.7 million inhabitants. The growing slums of the urban areas will offer a vivid example of a cultural transformation in a friction front. In parallel, my journey will seek for the Mbuti ethnic group from the Ituri Rainforest in Congo and the Baka people from Bomba Big National Park in Cameroon. These are the world's greatest hunter-gatherers populations. This way, the itinerary links two poles of the human relation with landscape. In both cases, I will ask for the same question about the creation of these habitats. The Brahmaputra Basin offers a rich and complex religious and symbolic ground, while it integrates the entire, urban or, or entire urbanization process of population, from the traditional village to peripheral slums in big cities such as Dhaka, the world's fastest growing city. I will observe from Dhaka to Tibet the creation of, the, of both the peripheral slums and the traditional village as a self-organized process. 
finally, traditional production tends to incorporate collective creative dynamics developed through time. The role of architects may range from the concept of architectural project to operate as a factor over the ground of a collective process, to decipher the parameters embedded in, tradi in tradition, the possibilities of crafts and tectonics, the role of culture and landscape broadens the reach of architecture over informal dynamics. The very, con the very concept of this dynamic is turned into a project matter and a source for rethinking the contemporary architectural production. But most importantly, we are among the last ones that can look at many living traditions that are now threatened. Whether it is an isolated Amazonian tribe or a global slam, most of the world's population inhabits informally constructed dwellings belonging to some sort of traditional building process. The concept of project is often alien to these habitats. To penetrate these dynamics, learn from them, and operate over their environments is the challenge that we face. Thank you for listening. Hi, uh, thank you everybody for the invitation. I'm really glad and honored to be here. My proposal is typed the uh, once in a lifetime, and I will explain you uh, a little bit later. But the subtitle would be The Architecture of the Ritual in Pilgrimage Sites. Um, my presentation will start with uh, what I believe as architecture uh, could be a ritual. Um, by the fact that uh, my uh, re design is completely research-based, so every time I produce a research, I'm also designing something, and my aim is to design. And, uh, and once in a lifetime will be the proposal, and then I will explain the travel itinerary and the methodology. Both my practice and my field research at the moment are reflecting the special implication of cultural pluralism uh, in the contemporary Western context in which I, I live and I study. And I'm personally interested uh, in the architecture as a system of rituals in which space is described by gestures that are repeated in time. Um, what I do is that I carefully reflect on what already happens to understand how uh, architecture takes place. And uh, I create projects in which I try to create uh, somehow pure context. Mm, I will start very biographically by uh, my graduation thesis and, and the first approach I had uh, to the topic, which was in December 2016 when I was in Sri Lanka. Um, at that time, uh, as architecture uh, graduate, um, I was uh, working for GTZ, which is the German Technical Cooperation. At that time, a uh, tsunami happened and was a, a really big uh, media um, uh, event. And uh, uh, Sri Lanka uh, was struck by this uh, wave that destroyed uh, around uh, 200,000 houses in a country that probably was producing 4,000 houses per year. So it was, uh, it was completely overwhelmed and uh, a lot of organi international organizations and, uh, and UN missions were de dealing with reconstruction. Uh, me as, a, as architect, I was, um, I was in charge of uh, implementing and redesigning uh, design projects coming from abroad. Usually I would receive a fax from Bruxelles or from Geneva, uh, the UN basis, and I would have to translate it into the field. Um, people were relocated uh, in uh, small villages at the periphery, uh, far from the coast, and um, UN agencies were paying new houses. And at that moment that I understood how the ritual and how the importance of spirituality actually could become a motivation to the production of space. Uh, in this case, you can see that uh, the four different religions present in Sri Lanka, uh, Hindu, Hindus, uh, Muslims, Catholics, and Buddhists, were um, basically put forward a completely different model of house, uh, starting from, from the model house we were producing. So one house became, in the end, four completely different typologies, uh, uh, given by uh, the necessity of rituals uh, that the community were putting forward. Uh, so the idea of spirituality can definitely become an urban issue because the villages were really completely uh, influenced by the, by the necessity of form of each different uh, cultural uh, group and, uh, um, and there's always been part of, uh, of history. 
Um, I will cite uh, Sibyl Molinagi, which, is, uh, uh, which was the wife of uh, Laszlo Molinagi, and uh, wrote this book called The Native Genius on, in a Nomino of Architecture. And uh, um, she is stating that uh, the history of architecture uh, started uh, as being predominantly a selection of means and meanings in deliberative panel environments. And basically, uh, when the settler uh, understood how uh, to um, uh, basically connect the physical and the spiritual forces into the architecture process. Uh, architecture as ritual uh, became uh, the driving force of my practice um, since that moment on, so after Sri Lanka. And in 2007, I started this wider research called Sacred Spaces in Profane Buildings. Um, Occasionally, I found this really remote place uh, in the Po Valley in Italy called Novellara, where, where the economy is completely based on, uh, on the production of uh, the Parmesan cheese. And uh, <laughs> the 45% of the population is actually immigrants. And uh, most of them are, are coming from India, Punjab, one region. And they are all six. And one day in a year, uh, the village uh, completely explodes into this festival, which is the Vaisaki, the Harvest Festival. It's the only day of the year in which you can see the community celebrating, because normally uh, they live in the outskirts uh, uh, of the villages. And this event struck me completely, uh, just to see also how the public spaces were completely uh, suitable for these kind of celebrations. And uh, the, ritual, uh, the ritual lunch in the soccer field was completely um, perfect for this event. Um, this expanded uh, into what uh, I was trying to understand. So how really uh, a contemporary city can, uh, can incorporate all this religious pluralism, which is the conditions we have today, and how, where are the new places in which this manifests? Um, when I moved to Barcelona, I decided to enter uh, a series of spaces uh, uh, that uh, were basically places to worship built inside um, um, informal, uh, informal settings. Uh, and I tried to map myself a uh, conditions that were not, uh, was not available anywhere, which were all the different religious communities present in the city and in the different areas. And that line was actually connecting uh, uh, each religion. Uh, each dot was a place of worship, and each religion was a type of line. It was a very long process and a bit also um, um, tiring physically because I was, uh, was going from one religion to the other and also was, dry, uh, was uh, tripping the city uh, trying to find these almost hidden spaces uh, here. Of course, these spaces are, commu are completely community based, are, com are completely connected with the uh, commercial activities around and being them um, related to uh, a strategy to avoid official registrations because of course we have to remind that it's uh, impossible to build uh, a religious business that is not a church uh, in, uh, in Europe is very difficult and it's very uh, tiring and long process. So in the meantime, places grow from within uh, the buildings. And they are, of course, multifunctional. So they are everything in one single room. So they, they are praying spaces, gathering spaces, teaching spaces, and, uh, and bars occasionally. But still, the features of the sacred are appearing inside these spaces. So there is always a hierarchy uh, between the outside and the inside. And the prayer and the, and the ritual is actually developing throughout, uh, throughout the architecture of the place. And from there, I draw the idea of producing these uh, spiritual devices in 2010. Mm, were simply boxes that were containing the objects that were to be found in these kind of informal spaces. It was very weird, but uh, each uh, community uh, seemed to, to have the same strategy to uh, furnish uh, uh, these places. So the sa same IKEA shelf, the same uh, digital clocks, uh, uh, the same carpets, uh, as if there was a sort of kit uh, for the production, for the instant production of sacred space. And, um, by discovering one by one each of these elements, I then uh, crossed it with, uh, with how the body is positioning uh, during the ritual. And in the end, I produced these boxes that were containing um, very profane objects, mass-produced objects, actually, that in the moment they were placed inside these kind of spaces, they, will be, they, will beco they were becoming uh, the objects of the ritual. And uh, um, the four boxes were actually uh, mirroring uh, each of the minorities I was uh, founding. Uh, uh, around the city, and, um, <coughs> and the, the, the geometry of the ritual, so uh, how the body would move according to a different ritual. And here, it's actually the paragon between them. 
And the book was containing all the research. The book was very uh, metaphorical, had a very hard uh, concrete cover, and basically contained all the information I gathered. And then uh, going on, when I moved to New York City, because I uh, got asked by uh, the director of Storefront for Art and Architecture to work on the city of New York, uh, that project, it became um, very difficult for me to understand how to, to read um, the same things in a city that has a completely different scale and there's a completely different uh, immigration history and, regula and, and regulations. And sacred spaces in profane buildings when traveling to New York uh, became this research that in the end was a sort of archival uh, material. Um, that was demonstrating somehow that the history is always the same and it's slow and uh, it's adopting, um, it's an adoptive process. So uh, um, a prayer space that starts on the ground with carpets in Brooklyn and then uh, as we see in, in Europe uh, goes uh, to the streets <coughs> and then becomes more or less a formalized shape uh, as in this case uh, the mosque Malcolm, uh, Malcolm Shabbat in, uh, in Harlem. And the history is not over yet. We are just in a moment uh, in which are wa we are waiting for the process to develop. But in the meantime in the US we still see the sacred symbol coming outside, coming outside of the building. So we, see, we still see the form and the cross and the Hindu temples that were AT&T supermarkets that are now uh, displaying completely uh, this kind of uh, architectures. Uh, this is in, in Corona, Queens. And the interiors are of course uh, what was, has been altered most to, to encompass and to uh, host uh, the ritual. Uh, as for instance this Sikh temple that used to be an uh, Orthodox church or in the mosque before and now it's a Sikh temple. And the inside hosts perfectly uh, all the necessity of the prayers uh, until uh, the bed that is hosting the sacred book, the Sri Guru Granth Sahib during the night. <laughs> Uh, this bed contains five copies of the same book. The book is very sacred, so only the priest can touch it. And every day the book is brought downstairs uh, where the altar is, and it's read uh, from the beginning to the end. And then um, uh, at, at night it's put back uh, to the bed. And of course it's the best room of the, of the temple, and uh, there's AC and there's everything uh, necessary for the life of the book. Um, just uh, to uh, enlarge the picture from the very micro to the very macro scale, uh, Manhattan and Queens and all the boroughs of New York are filled with this kind of spaces. And um, even uh, Lower Manhattan has like a, something like a hundred different congregations and uh, um, Buddhist temples and any kind of religion is present in the, in the city towards these very uh, small uh, outposts that, uh, that religious has. And sometimes you still see the symbols outside, but sometimes not. And this is got quite struck into me when I started mapping these places and each of the numbers are indicating one place and as you follow the shape you basically reconstruct the whole geography of the city without even having the boundaries of the city. Uh, so uh, the whole New York can be depicted by uh, highlighting simply the, the religious buildings, like these informal ones, not even the formal ones. And, um, when in the end I got back to, um, to Italy and I was invited at the Venice Biennale to talk about uh, a very documentary idea of Italy, I decided to work on the celebration day, that very famous celebration day I explained to you at the beginning, uh, where architecture can also be simply made of people. And uh, uh, that day uh, the city from this situation, which is the everyday situation, becomes this one and reveals uh, the actual uh, population, citizens and economy of this kind of rural villages. And, uh, and every public space is uh, perfectly suitable and utilized uh, for the procession. Uh, that starts from the first Sikh temple built in Italy um, to, to, the, to the main square. Uh, this, of course, uh, uh, reveals, uh, uh, like that feast, uh, is uh, it's just an excuse to reveal a completely uh, wider picture in which we have at least other 50 Gurvaras, uh, only in the Po Valley. And, uh, uh, and this uh, would uh, be, to, uh, be added to other parts of Italy, other agricultural lands in which six are milking uh, to produce the milk for the um, Parmesan cheese. And uh, um, those are some examples that are architecture that are always a little bit like a uh, mediation between regulations, ad hoc situations with the municipalities, but then uh, the inside are really revealing the necessity of form and the necessity of, uh, of the ritual uh, to produce a shape. Um, so those are all pictures taken from the same places. And, and that was the installation of the Biennale, two large lenticular prints that were revealing slowly uh, the, 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 the square empty and the square completely filled with people. 
uh, and the book was acting as a sort of uh, um, instruction manual uh, to understand and detect uh, uh, what was happening uh, during the feast. Here you have a very uh, cheap version of the most sacred one you had at the, at the Biennale. And this uh, small chef was just describing uh, all the regulations necessary to produce for instance, a Sikh temple in a country like Italy where uh, only a Catholic church could be built uh, without, uh, without instructions. And um, the ritual is on display also in very profane projects I've done uh, in the recent past. Uh, for instance, this one, uh, Mineral Vassar, is simply a bar, a pavilion, in, the, in a garden in Mexico City. And this very long frame just divides the garden in two and uh, uh, produces a space that is just framed, uh, framed by the... By, by the frame itself and divides uh, uh, the place for people uh, to have a drink uh, and pursue uh, the beauty of this garden. And at the same way, uh, this turquoise is simply the container, a wireframe container of uh, uh, somebody, uh, in this case me, descending up and uh, descending down from this really dangerous staircase <laughs> built uh, in Milan. And uh, going on, we can see Ground Atlas as a collection of uh, uh, of rituals uh, that maybe could be the manifesto of, uh, of my ideas and um, I always got very interested by how people chooses a very specific place to place its towel at the beach or uh, the sites where to eat its panini in Piazza del Campo in Siena or uses, uh, or uses any kind of public park. There's always a selection and somehow that selection goes towards the production of, uh, of a space that can be pursued in very difficult, in very different ways. This one was simply a platform descending on the water. So the dimension was the dimension of a fountain, but on the other side it could be intended as a sort of portion of a larger landscape, um, such as a beach or uh, any kind of natural place. And um, it was a pool also, and simply, uh, simply a square, like a very typical Italian square in which people just sit and um, think about uh, what's next, and um, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the, the back side of it, and uh, was meant to be, um, to be uh, built at the Maxi Museum in Rome. Yeah. And um, just to conclude, this uh, was another uh, attempt uh, to produce uh, uh, flooring, paving systems, uh, stone paving systems that were encompassing the ritual uh, in a very delicate but also uh, uh, um, sublimim in our way. Yeah, I'm Once in a lifetime uh, gets from the objects to the space, place, to the journey. And uh, to me, uh, I intend it as the last part of this longer research I've done. And uh, um, what I can say is that uh, throughout the course of history, man has fluctuated between a tendency to try to include sacredness in the architectural constructions and allow to be surrounded by holiness by identifying it with nature. But pilgrimage seem to uh, combine both tendencies. Once in a lifetime, uh, the religious man takes a journey in search of a spiritual significance, uh, a pilgrimage. The pilgrim gathers with thousands of people in a specific site. The place of birth or death of founders of saints, or place uh, connection with the divine, the locations where the miracle, where was, where the miracle was performed, uh, or where a deity is said to be houses, or a place that is seen to have special spiritual powers. Of course, in 2012, we think that uh, pilgrimage are over, but pilgrimage are one of the biggest economies of the world, and 200,000 visitors are actually uh, visiting these places. Uh, what I plan to do is to visit uh, the most important uh, pilgrimage places uh, in, uh, in the world, such as Lourdes, Mecca, Jerusalem, and Pushkar uh, in India, and um, trying to detect the logic of the ritual uh, after that, and produced by, uh, by the people. And uh, of course, I cannot uh, go to Mecca as being non-Muslim, but I will find a way to, uh, to be helped by somebody I trust with. And uh, interesting to <laughs> Uh, it's interesting to see that the ritual is producing space, but also space is a necessary uh, part of, uh, of, the, of the process. And architecture needs to be, to be there uh, to host uh, the, the majority, uh, this, this mass of people touring around the uh, Kaaba and doing all the, and the rituals connected to it. Mm, and Jerusalem, of course, being one of the most important city for uh, the only city for uh, three religions, the main of the main religions of the world. 
and, uh, and the Pushkar in India where a lake uh, is considered to be sacred and uh, uh, touring the lake is uh, the most uh, uh, sacred thing you could do and then these guards are actually the architecture that is produced in order to host, uh, to host the celebration and allow people to bath into these holy waters. And if I, if I have time, I would also uh, reactualize the message and demonstrate how pilgrimage are completely contemporary in the way uh, they produce uh, these kind of spaces in uh, Ruta del Peregrino, just uh, recently built in 2010, was finished uh, uh, in, uh, in Mexico. Mm. To conclude, I would do the, the Camino de Santiago backwards uh, to go back to, to my own country. Uh, as a, as a, a perfect ground tour, I would go back to my own town and start building things that maybe will not be a spiritual, uh, spiritual meaning, but uh, encompass a lot of uh, uh, the reading of the ritual uh, itself. So um, it looks like I could be obsessed by, by the religious meaning of things, but uh, I can say that it's a very good excuse uh, to understand how a spirituality can produce uh, a rhythm and can produce a space. Uh, I would use uh, this kind of uh, uh, religious uh, pilgrimage uh, travel agencies that would probably bring me the, in, into the best way uh, to these places and allow me to visit uh, with the time I need. Um, and uh, uh, each city will be analyzed by, uh, for one specific point of view, which is the crowd that moves and the gesture that accomplishes. And objects, people, rituals will definitely, in my uh, reading, become the architecture of this uh, once-in-a-lifetime achievement uh, uh, that uh, people pursue uh, during their life. So architecture as future reels, and how to design a ritual and how gestures become architecture will be the aim of uh, the production of this atlas of different pilgrimage around the world that will encompass uh, either natural or artificial uh, places and uh, become uh, the architectures I mean. Thank you. First of all, of course, thank you to the Wilbright Committee and Harvard GSD for having me here. It's an honor to share this panel with such talented finalists and to have the opportunity to share my work with you and the values of Kitchener City. In 1973, the first mobile phone appeared and it offered uh, a talk time of just 30 minutes. At that time, we used to spend 32 hours per week on housekeeping duties. Nowadays, our mobile phones have eight hours of talk time on 3G, but we still spend 32 hours per week to housekeeping duties. Where our everyday life has improved thanks to new technologies, our homes haven't been able to decrease daily labor, waste, and consumption. And that is a housing and urban design problem. It's not only about technology, it's also about just typology. There was a time in New York when the house was understood as an open system. It was designed not as a single entity, not as a unique piece, but as a set of connected fragments that could change depending on the need. The space was flexible and adaptable on demand and expanded by means of collective rooms and domestic services. The kitchen was optional as the rest of the rooms, and sometimes it was left apart, becoming kitchenless. This typology blurred the traditional limit between the public and the, urban, and the private sphere, between the domestic and the, urban, and, and, sorry, and the urban sphere. And thanks to its flexibility, and sharingly, was able to shrink radically housekeeping costs, waste, and labor. I believe that this systems cases remain good reference on not only to address new domestic proposals, for the present, but also for the discipline at large for architecture. That is actually what I research and work about in my office, Mayo, special systems for social welfare. Let me be also kind of autobiographical and explain you why I end up working about this 
five years ago, with my partners, Maria Cerneco, Alfredo Lerida, and Guillermo Lopez, we decided to open a studio for professionals from different fields. At that time, it was 2011, in Spain, we were in a deep crisis, not, economic, not only economical and professional, but mainly, and that's super important, mainly social. We had the need to design new ways of producing architecture in order to face the instability of the moment. With that goal in mind, we refurbished an existing first floor in Barcelona. We took off the roof and the floor of an existing room, opening a patio and dividing the initial space into two areas. The front area is left, is, uh, the, front, the front area is open to the street and left empty to accommodate activities related to the public as events and exhibitions. Among other things, we host a pop-up gallery in a little room that is just seven feet per seven feet. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I like to think that it is, or I think that it might be probably the smallest architectural gallery in the world. <laughs> On the other side of the patio, the rear area, is intended as a main workspace and defined by a 12 and a half meters long table where users sit along and share their work and experience <coughs> directly. In Mayo, working teams and collaborations are flexible and variable depending on the need. We have a mutable infrastructure, so to say, where everyone has its own role and it works under an horizontal hierarchy, not a pyramidal hierarchy. These two spaces work as an, a bypass. Everything is, that is talk and exhibit at the front space has an influence in our projects, oh, and in the projects that we produce at the back space, and vice versa. For us, there's no such a distinction between theory and practice. I'm pretty sure that all of us considered at the beginning that this sharedness and flexible situation was gonna be a temporary thing, just an experimental and turning point moment but at the end, it was not. Along these years, it became not only a way of working, but also a way of understanding architecture. As it happens with our way of working, for us, architecture organizes and builds relations, defining possible futures. It doesn't have a beginning or an end, but rather it's a continuity of something precedent that will be continued in its future. Architecture is therefore always in a permanent state of unfinishedness. That is one of the reasons why in Mayo, we believe in special systems, a type of order that allows approbation and change through time. Our designs are always open, allowing performability, adaptation, and modification. We believe that architecture is not about what it is, it's about what it can be. Soon after the opening of the new space, we won a competition held by the City Council of Barcelona. With the crisis, the city was filled with empty lots waiting to be built, that needed to be occupied in order to avoid decay. The competition demanded to design an ephemeral urban space that has to last at least 15 years, not a short time. The budget was really extremely tight, not enough to fulfill all neighbors' needs and wishes. Therefore, we, designed to design, we, we decided to design a system that could grow and allow mutability through time, but also, also that could <laughs> engage thanks to its mutability, citizens' appropriation and social engagement. The proposal is based on a definition of a regular grid of poles that organizes the urban space and holds lighting and electrical system. The grid is completed by a tensional cable, as you see, that works as a temporary support for possible social performances. The size of the grid allows to fit the maximum possible neighbor's requirements. The project proposes an, an, an urban space understood as an unfinished space. We did not build a square, but we designed the potential conditions that will allow its open definition in the future by means of social consensus and dissent. Since we built the grid, it has been completed in many different ways from many neighbors' meetings and discussions. During these last two years, they have decided to place in the grid shadows, a playground, a fountain, a temporary market, trees and plants, and a statue, very important for them, 
and we are looking to see we're looking to see how it keeps on growing and changing in the following years. Since then, since that project, we have been working with the spatial systems in different scale and type of projects. For instance, soon after that, a school of art and design asked us to de to design an exhibition for a museum of their work in a museum. Sorry. We convinced them to produce a modular exhibition display system that they could reuse afterwards. The system consists of a thin metal structure easily to transport and assembly, which form define the minimum expression of an exhibition space, a corner, a simple architectural element that can be adapted to different contexts and contexts, allowing an almost infinite combination of spatial possibilities. We proceed in the same way when we were asked to refurbish an existing bar by means of a special identity that had to be applied in other locations as well. To that end, a new vaulted ceiling was created, defining a type of order that could be repeated in other locations and easily. In this recent, sorry. In these recent years, we have been able to work on special systems also in the domestic sphere, not only researching about kitchenless, my main topic, and other domestic systems, but also in our practice. After six months, next Friday, this Friday, we'll close at the Museum of Contemporary Art of Barcelona, MAGBA, the exhibition Species of Spaces, based on Perec's homonymous book. We design a display that aim to transport the generic space of a museum into a domestic one, by means of a grid of a square rooms of identical dimensions. We built a house of generic rooms where the specificity of each space is defined by the content, but not the continent. And this is exactly the strategy that we have taken into account into a housing block that we are just building now in the center of Barcelona. And these are pictures that I just we took just before coming here, so it's really under construction. Uh, but the facade looks more finished, as you will see. The client asked us to design a housing block that its interior arrangement could be mutable. It had to be mutable, its program itself, in order to answer to a changes of the demand, of the short sale demand. Meanwhile, the facade and the ground, now, and the ground floor uh, tries to consolidate the traditional typology of the neighborhood following neighbor's facade proportion and materiality. In the interior, the arrangement of the apartments is designed as a system of rooms that can be used as desired. And where the program is not determined, answering to the client demand, each apartment can be expanded or reduced, adding or subtracting rooms in order to answer to inhabitants' needs. For the next coming years, the follow-up plan is divided as a set of four apartments each of room containing five rooms, and rooms are connected among them, no corridor is needed, and the kitchenette is placed right in the middle, acting as a center of the house. The other, the other rooms are gonna be used as bedrooms or living rooms. We had tried this arrangement before in a smaller project with success in a house in Mallorca, where four equal size rooms per floor plan were located at the corners, allowing the kitchen to be placed in the center, acting both as a dividing element and a connection between those spaces. As I mentioned before, this kind of flexible apartments were usual at the verge of the 20th century in New York, where the house was understood as an open system, mutable and adaptable on demand. For instance, the apartment of the San Remo had an adjoining room that could be opened, expanding the initial space with an extra room, connecting two, three, or even four apartments, the whole floor plan. This historical typology has had been clearly a uh, reference to address our housing block, our actual building, uh, an actual building that answers to actual needs. Eight years ago, when I, I started researching about this typology, and I've been always convinced about their actuality. I was fascinated by the fact that they, they are flexible and also that they were supplied with domestic services which include collective kitchens, dining rooms, central vacuum systems, nurseries, and much more. 
The domestic realm was wider than its actual limits, affecting the urban sphere. It, the house was not, not only understood, uh, it was, I'm sorry, the house was understood as a system that went beyond its physicality. It was not, and what is really important, it was not just having a space on demand, it was also about having services on demand. The story of this New York um, kitchenless typology dates back to the economical depression that followed, that followed the American Civil War in 1865. At that moment, new architectural solutions for middle class appeared that not only reduced significantly the cost of living, but also allowed the elimination of housekeeping annoyances. In New York, the kitchenless housing had its peak, as you see in the, floor, in, in the maps, between 1901 and 1929 and along with conveniences of comfort, and comfort that um, provided flexible apartments at collective um, domestic services a la carte, they work as semi-public facilities, becoming the true social condensers. For instance, the one that we have in the picture, the Belle Claire, located at 77th Street and Broadway, had offices, stores on the ground floor, as well as public lounges and dining rooms. And as you see, a rooftop open to the public. Along having this public character, although having this public, public character, these new residential houses had a strongly speculative and commercial aim. They were considered profitable investments by the private sector. That is one of the reasons why it was highly appreciated that these apartments could be flexible, not only to offer a good service for its inhabitants, but also to satisfy a, by, a bigger demand and to accommodate a wider social range. At the beginning of the 20th century, this American typology was largely published, worldwide influence, published worldwide, sorry, influencing the construction of similar housing examples with collective housekeeping facilities, some of them, that some of them are still running today. Since I finished uh, the New York research, I have been searching similar cases worldwide and I have to be thankful to my students and colleagues who have me, helped me out with this. And as you see, uh, from all type of, uh, all the world, and also from all type of periods, from historical to actual ones. Some of them directly influenced by the American apartments, and I, I'm sure about that. Some of them just not, they came out. The typology has appeared in different contexts and answered to different needs in an incredible manner we just know the peak of the iceberg. Meanwhile, collective kitchens and kitchenless living has been popularly known by its communist character, and I'm tired of listening to that. No, you're communist in this context. This collection of cases, including the New Yorker ones, prove that on the opposite, that typology is apolitical. It has been sometimes used as a political tool, but as Aldo Rossi claims, form cannot be political per se, in fact, it can be only repoliticized again and again over the course of the time in a never ending recurring cycle. Studying them, it's quite clear that their, their motives and origins go beyond the political and can be classified in three cases. Those that have been promoted by the private sector, so mostly with a commercial interest, those that have been self promoted and self organized by its inhabitants and those that have been promoted by the government. My will write process pro, pro, <laughs> proposes to visit an heterogenic selection of these cases that are still in use nowadays in order to have a potential cross look. Thanks to my own practice in Mayo, I am aware that a system cannot be understood until it is in under use. So it requires time to understand its values and its failures. The will write Prize will offer me the possibility to visit these places, to live in them, really important, and to learn how these domestic systems have been appropriated by its users and are being really used. My goal is to visualize these unknown realities and to, unco to, have, to come out with a common atlas of domestic systems for social welfare, an operative housing design tool able to increase social cohesion and decrease labor, waste, and energy consumption. My first step will be Cuba. Cuba, 1963, after the revolution, 
The new government promoted the construction of new towns in rural areas, as Sandino, where houses had collective spaces as kitchens. Meanwhile, at La Habana, most of the representative buildings were built, and is the architecture that we all know well. The real domestic revolution was happening in the frontier side. A little bit earlier, during the late 40s and 50s in Rio de Janeiro, Carmen Portinho, who at that time was in charge of the Department of Popular Housing, promoted the construction of housing with collective services for their workers. Among all the projects she promoted, probably the most famous one, and you might know it, is Pedregullo. Designed by Alfonso Eduardo Reidy, had 270 housing units of different sizes and include sharing spaces as collective kitchens, bathrooms, living rooms, a daycare, a healthcare, a gymnasium, and a swimming pool, an extraordinary city within a city. Portini promoted also smaller projects that are, for me, most, most, much more interesting, less known, and, and, but really good, as Gabea, this one, similar to Portinho, or Paquetá, that just housed 27 families. Almost 60 years later, we don't know how these domestic systems have been used and are nowadays used. My interest to visit these examples, this, this couple of historical cases, is precisely this one, to understand how a domestic system is displayed and modified during a large period of time. After Cuba and Brazil, I will head to India. Nowadays, in India, collective kitchens are actually pumping up thanks to solar cooking. A cooking technology accessible, easy to build up from scratch and by anyone, and efficient when it's collective. At Tilonia, the Barefoot College teaches rural women how to manuf manufacture cook and solar cookers in order to help them to have an income as well as decrease their home consumes. They have also built a solar um, collective kitchen that serves meal to the whole community. In this case, the domestic system appears when the kitchen is eliminated from the home and it's turned collective. Similar, something similar is happening in Canada and Australia. I'm not gonna go, but it's happening there. Where multiple associations promote community kitchens to reduce consumes, waste, and labor, as well as to assure healthy food consumption. They're recent and growing a lot. In Canada, there are already more than 1,500 com community kitchens already registered. In my point of view, these cases are interesting due to their capacity to change a neighborhood, a whole neighborhood, just with the construction of a community kitchen. Something is not necessary to build a whole domestic system in order to uh, affect and change the existing reality. China. Meanwhile, with these examples are self-organized and self-promoted. In China, collective domestic spaces and services are being promoted nowadays by the private sector. Lei Jun, the founder of the mobile phone company Xiaomi, is building affordable housing for, with shared spaces for young generations with salary can barely support their basic living cost. There are already 18 complex in different cities of China that host around 5,000 people and they are growing. In Japan, a, slim, a similar case is happening. In 2012, for the first time, the percentage of people living alone in Tokyo topped the 50%. The society is changing rapidly, as well the, as their housing typologies. We can, find, we can find there from big scale housing projects with shared spaces that have been built by the government, as the Shinanome Kanakor, Tokyo, well known, to a smaller projects built by the private sector, as, they, as these ones. Similar thing is happening in South Korea, where the government is starting to promote this kind of sharing culture to improve living quality in their dense cities. These cases are rare, less known, and for me, really interesting. And the last case study, but not the least, will be the Russian Comunalcas. Communal houses that resulted after a process of compartimentation of existing apartment buildings this type of communal apartment became the predominant form of housing in the Soviet Union and are still in use nowadays. Here, my interest resides in the fact that these domestic systems were implemented on the preexisting, over the preexisting. From the beginning of my trip, I will be sharing my encounters online. 
as an open chronicle of an experience that through glimpses will open up a whole new domestic reality. That, we, that would be my principal outcome and my methodology. The online platform will make public the common atlas of domestic systems for social welfare, hoping to disseminate globally this operative housing design tool and to produce the right effect. That's the main goal. In my way back home, as an homage, I will stop at the Sac Fabrice in Vienna. Sorry. Probably the most outstanding case built in the recent years, a community that starts from scratch, a self-promoted and self-organized building typology that nowadays has become a part of the domestic systems and I think an important public and cultural institutions. It will be the right place to start sharing my research in the final phase beyond the online platform. I hope that my encounters will open up a new world, a new architectural reality that is happening worldwide and that has that can be a good reference to address new cases and to improve our everyday lives. Thank you. morning and first of all thank you it's uh, it's really a privilege uh, to be here um, these two things as you might know are on the right the Weissenhof Siedlung in Stuttgart Germany and uh, um, on the left um, Mount Rushmore in uh, South Dakota, America, uh, United States of America. Now, these two things seem to share very little, uh, but actually they've been both built in 1927, although uh, Mount Rushmore uh, took a bit longer to be completed and was completed only in the 40s. Um, I think it's interesting because these two things that have been built at the same time uh, received a very different type of attention in um, architectural theory. Um, we can say that one of the two was extremely important for architectural theory of the last century and then the other one was absolutely uh, insignificant. Um, this is also strange because uh, uh, the one that was totally irrelevant for architectural theory, the Mount Rushmore, uh, was uh, extremely well received in uh, not only pop culture, but also uh, in uh, um, film industry, and also received attention by intellectuals such as photographers or movie directors. Think, think only of uh, uh, Hitchcock's uh, North by Northwest, uh, Northwest, for instance. Um, so somehow, uh, th this is also remarkable because if we would uh, uh, consider Mount Rushmore from the point of view of architecture, of pre-modern architectural theory, for sure, uh, there would have been some sort of attention uh, to that uh, type of phenomenon. But uh, um, recent architectural theory has not been able to uh, find a way to look at phenomena such as Mount Rushmore. Now, uh, this is a, a quote by, uh, by Wittgenstein. It's one of his uh, remarks on Fraser's uh, Golden Bow. And Wittgenstein basically says that uh, um, a possible starting point for uh, an anthropology is that uh, we could observe the um, actions of, of human beings and subdivide them into two categories, what he calls uh, animal activities that he defines, like taking food, uh, drinking, sleeping, blah, 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 uh, and ritualistic uh, actions that, that he um, significantly doesn't define. So the ritualistic are just the one, uh, according to this definition by Wittgenstein, they are just the ones who are not uh, animal activities. But it doesn't say uh, much more. Uh, I think this is a, a very generic, maybe, but could be a starting point to start observing 
uh, a series of phenomena uh, that have been uh, ignored in uh, recent uh, architectural theory. Now, and, and I think these phenomena, uh, these uh, ritualistic, uh, uh, these uh, spaces associated with ritualistic actions, have been uh, ignored uh, because of the very foundation of what we could call at large modern architecture. That uh, here I would uh, uh, consider modern architecture everything that uh, starts from the presuppositions uh, set up by Logier's essay of 1753. Uh, and I think this is very clear if we compare um, the Logier definition of uh, beginning of architecture with the uh, traditional definition by Vitruvius. Uh, and it's also visually evident if we compare these two things. One is the uh, engraving by Charles Eisen that goes with the second edition of uh, uh, L'Essai de, um, by Loger. And uh, uh, this is one of the engraving of the um, edition of Vitruvius by Cesariano of 1521, uh, if I'm not wrong. Um, the two scenes represent the uh, origin of architecture, uh, and, um, and uh, although the engraving by, uh, by Eisen doesn't really uh, follow the narration of Loger at the beginning of, of the essay, uh, there's one thing that they share, and that makes them uh, completely different from the scene described by Vitruvius in uh, Book Second, where he talks about the origin of architecture. Uh, and the primitive man who builds the primitive art for Roger is completely alone. Is Adam, but he doesn't even have uh, whatsoever Eve together with him. He is absolutely alone, like Robinson Crusoe on his own island, while on the contrary, um, the uh, theory uh, based on Vitruvius, who is uh, bases his uh, narration uh, fundamentally on, uh, on Plato's Cratilo, uh, already talks of a society. So the, the, the first scene is crowded in Vitruvius. Um, and this means that these uh, people who invented uh, architecture doesn't, doesn't really invent the architecture, but invented the city, and invented the city together with language, and these things, from the beginning, included issues like sexuality, rituality, also violence. You see all these people with these stones, they're quite scary. Um, now, if we uh, consider, uh, compare um, the narration of Loger with uh, Robinson Crusoe, uh, that defines the same type of uh, liberal subjectivity in literature, or uh, with uh, the definition of same type of uh, liberal subject in uh, a Smith uh, Wealth of Nation that is uh, uh, published uh, some 20 years after uh, Loger essay. Uh, what we can say is that uh, in the field of economics, uh, there's been a lot of criticism of this narration of the origins. And this criticism has been based on uh, anthropological evidence. Uh, think of the work of uh, uh, Mar uh, Malinowski, Marcel Mauss, uh, Carpolani, anybody. Uh, anybody uh, dismissed the narration of Smith uh, uh, starting from the fact that uh, it's not individuals who exchange at the beginning, it's communities who exchange. Um, this uh, radical questioning of the subject of modern architecture didn't happen in architectural theory. There has been episodes, uh, I think, uh, um, Adolf Loos, uh, uh, and certainly uh, Rossi's The Architecture of the City has been very uh, uh, important contribution uh, in this respect. Uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, Rossi somehow immediately after more or less putting together all of the pieces started to do a completely different type of, of, of research. So uh, I believe there is a space for doing this work. Uh, developing a critique of the type of subjectivity implicit in uh, modern architecture, so broadly understood. Uh, but I also think it's possible to combine these 
with a more realistic description of the world in which we live in, where there's still plenty of monuments, still plenty of ritualistic uh, uh, landscapes. Uh, something that could guide us a bit uh, is a book that I think is extremely interesting uh, and a bit overlooked probably, that is uh, uh, The Entwurf einer historischen Architektur by Johann Bernhard Fischer von Erl. A book that Fischer uh, published in 1721, but actually he wrote uh, all, like he, he designed, because it's mainly his drawing, uh, all in, I think, 1710s, uh, when he was fearing um, that uh, his job as architect of the emperor uh, could be in danger. Uh, the book is made of these um, large, uh, um, 50 by 70 um, drawings uh, that describe um, a series of monuments of different um, of different uh, epochs and of different uh, countries. Um, Fisher uh, defines in the in the French version of the of the book. The book is both in French and in German. In the, fr in the French edition, uh, Fisher claims that what he wants to achieve, uh, it's a very, it's an amazing formula, is une, une idée générale de la diversité des bâtiments de l'Antiquité et de toutes les nations. So uh, it's a, uh, a tendentially comparative approach that uh, uh, is both uh, searching in time, but also searching in place. And Fisher is incredibly accurate it's always searching for sources. And this is, for instance, the uh, explication, uh, the, the caption of the drawing uh, regarding Mecca. Of course, he didn't go to Mecca, he couldn't, uh, but he, um, through the Austrian ambassadors in, uh, in Constantinople, he could get uh, all of this evidence. And then he maps all of these drawings. And the book is. Um, the Antwerp is subdivided in five books. The first, uh, uh, like the, the last one is about vases for some reason, I never understood. Uh, the fourth one is Project by Fisher, but the first three are um, dedicated to, um, oh, well, first of all, the, the first book is the Temple of Jerusalem and Seven Wonders plus something. The second book is more or less about Roman architecture. And the third one is about uh, Arabic, uh, Ottoman, and Chinese architecture. Uh, what is interesting is that the collection of uh, things that, uh, that Fisher puts together is based on uh, the seven wonders that he takes from Plinius uh, classification. This is uh, the mausoleum of Alicarnassus. This is the Colossus of uh, Rhodes. Uh, what is interesting about the Seven Wonders compared to uh, the primitive art of Loger is the Seven Wonders are seven, and they are immediately a plural uh, set that provides a plural starting point uh, for uh, architecture. And together with that, and, and you, we, we see here the same problem of classification that we saw before in uh, in Wittgenstein's quote, uh, there's not only uh, buildings, there are also certain extremely specific landscapes uh, that, are, that they are culturally marked, such as these uh, Nile cataracts, uh, what is now been um, removed with the lower uh, Asran Dam. Um, and, and this landscape, they, I think they belong to this uh, collection because they are so clearly uh, associated to a collective memory that they are not just nature anymore, they are also culture. I think something similar, I believe, happens in um, Spielberg's movie, uh, Strange Encounters of the Third Kind, where the aliens decide to land at uh, a Devil's Tower in Wyoming. And by doing that, somehow mark Devil's Tower as architecture, no more as a mountain or whatever it is. Here we see the uh, curiosity of Fisher, the capacity to uh, include in its uh, collection of the 
early 18th century, so it's quite remarkable, I think. Uh, um, architecture coming from the very, very, this is the Forbidden City, for instance, from very, very different um, collections. Uh, the, the, the complete uh, series of, uh, of, um, of cases included into Fisher uh, collection can be mapped, and there's, uh, uh, and I tried with some collaborators to do these book by book, uh, naming all of the sources you see in the, uh, in the, um, in the last column to the, to the right, there is the amount of people or animals that you have. And in the other one, you have all the sources. And you see it's super uh, precise in naming uh, where it gets the information from. Uh, and there's, of course, uh, a lot of other issues, like issues of categorization, and also issues of time. Because, uh, for instance, Fisher was operating without a clear, it was, the book was written in the moment in which it was uh, still um, relatively uncommon to think that the chronology established by the Bible uh, would not hold true. Uh, but at the same time, it was clear to many that there were uh, signs of different civilization, things that couldn't really fit there. So for instance, chronology is an incredibly complicated issue for, uh, for Fisher, but this maybe uh, we can skip now. Uh, and what I propose to do is to try to redo the exercise uh, Fisher did. Uh, and I tried uh, last year at the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago to do this exercise about the United States, making this list, trying to classify the, f uh, the different uh, wonders that are both uh, spaces of rituals, but also colossal elements, sometimes, particularly in America, uh, because uh, this was done together with the students who were um, citizens of the US who uh, had a better clue uh, about what is perceived as cu culturally significant inside of this context, um, are also uh, natural elements like parks or uh, geysers or uh, even trees like sequoias. Uh, so what we did was to map this thing, try to define a calendar, uh, try to classify somehow, uh, and we try to describe each of these different uh, uh, objects, um, of these different places, uh, according, in trying to describe their own logistic and their own rituality. And then, uh, starting from that, starting, we uh, produced uh, uh, design exercises, a little bit in the manner of Fisher, who redesigned more or less everything because he had no sources uh, to, to really know what the buildings would look like. So these are some of the attempts. Normally, uh, the, the exercise was uh, to redesign taking the uh, ritualistic actions as granted, as untouchable and allowing the redefinition of the logistic and of the architecture. Uh, yeah, it, what I uh, propose to do is simply to uh, go on with this uh, research uh, and to visit places uh, where these contemporary uh, rituals take place. So for instance, the rituals associated with Muharram in, uh, in Iran. So this thing that I guess is called Nakl Bardani or something like that. Uh, but also the, um, the temporary places where these um, passion plays called Tadzie are uh, played. Um, but also things like NASCAR uh, racing, um, and again, uh, places of pilgrimage like uh, Lourdes or uh, the Nazareno Negro in Manila, Cumbumela, um, and also some specific objects like these are the uh, Coptic churches on the uh, Mokatam Hills that have been built there, these colossal church, uh, Coptic churches uh, built in the 70s by simply digging into the rocks with the 
um, it's not the caterpillar, it's the, I don't know, excavator, I don't know the word, but like, the machine that smashes the rock. And then all of these um, drawings built on the, on the uh, realized on top of the rocks are realized with the, um, with the machine with the disc, uh, I don't know the, the name of it uh, in English, that you use normally to cut the stone with this uh, rotating whatever. Um, and this is uh, a building that is uh, wanted to be a, a copy of St. Peter in a, a city called Yamasuko, if I'm not wrong, uh, in uh, Ivory Coast. Um, thank you very much. Cool, thanks very much. Um, you can have all the finalists. So all the finalists sit here and I'll sit here. No. to maybe frame the question um, to focus it. First of all, just, just two real quick things. Those, we've been emphasizing at the school thesis projects and themes and arguments through design. And it's kind of spectacular that we have these examples of how to produce or how to present a thesis. So thank you for that, how we, how we present it argument is based on research. Um, and I was struck that all of, all of them, what they sh have in common, we talked a bit about this before you know, in the room upstairs, they're all about action. They're all about taking some kind of action. They all have temporal dimensions. Uh, they're all very socially driven. So I, I want to try to distinguish um, the proposals, but also ask you to to go a little bit further. I'm, I'm going to ask all the questions, and then, then we'll just start. Um, in, in Matilda's, part of my question, and I'm going to bring these all together, I'm going to try to, part of the question has to do with where the research and the analysis and the documentation, how does that meet some sort of design action? Okay, so this is, this is what they share. In Matilda's, for example, you, 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 a lot of your installations, a lot of your curations, it, it deals with representation. There's a lot of photography. There's a lot of some very compelling ways of representing. But what I'd like for you to reflect on is the difference between observing and representing and analyzing. How, how can we move from these very vivid and compelling representations of a, of a situation to analysis. And what I'm skeptical of the word method and methodology a little bit, but maybe a little bit how you get to analysis to extract patterns, to extract knowledge. And with Samuel, um, also then, I think the analysis in your case is, I think you have maybe more examples of, of analysis, and certainly observation. But with yours, I'd like to reflect a little bit on the distinction between analysis and intervention. How some of your projects, you showed projects where there was clearly like the, like the large, I can't remember how it's called, the, the large communal building. That's clearly an intervention. But what is the relationship between that intervention and the analysis? And how can we expect the analysis and the intervention to to be related. So I'm going from representation to analysis, and then from analysis to inter intervention. And I think this is a little bit too uh, 
conceited in the way I'm doing, but, but I think it works. With Anna, um, you do have interventions. There were a lot of installations. Like, like Matilda, so you, you've had curatorial experience, you've had installation, uh, installation experience, but, but yours were even more, um, more designed than observational, but much of the design was the design of flexibility. I would say. So for you, how do you reflect on, in your research of the kitchenless city, how do we move toward just a desire that the intervention be flexible versus the desire that the intervention learns from your analysis in a more specific, how does it affect, how does it, how does it organize uh, to produce results rather than just allow results, okay? Mm -hmm. So something, something like that. I think, and then Pierre Paolo, um, Paolo, I, there was something, there's something about the idea that you presented of an atlas of the wonders of the world, which risks uh, quality turning into quantity. And I, and I think I mean quality, architectural quality, turning into mere quantity. The earliest, the biggest, the fastest, the, the, the oldest, some, something like this. Um, so, so how do you, in your analysis, in your research, avoid evacuating the specificity of the architectural quality into a more general quantification, or something like this. So, so this is a way, of, I think, of framing challenges to the research. And, and you can answer these in bits and pieces and back and forth. Um, and if someone doesn't start, yes, I Moses? Just, yeah. I, just, I, because I have to go, like everybody else. Just, yeah. I, you, were, you were incredibly kind of subtle, and I think it's okay. it's, it's it's wonderful, and I hope that people will have time to to answer it mm -hmm. in the kind of subtle way that you ask. But just from the perspective of the people who have been looking at kind of 400 projects and so on and so forth, one thing that I think Michael mentioned, which is very important, is that we have many awards, for example, in the school that look at urbanization or cities, and so this is our main project which is really looking at um, the contributions that people are going to make towards the advancement of architectural discourse, architecture. So, so there is something about the specificity of this. And one thing that I would say is that the grand tour, when people went on it, travel was not the same as it is today. So there was something about the mystery of, of the discovery because you went and found and then you brought. So there's a direct correlation between the trip and the idea of the discovery, which could then have consequences in terms of the project. Or in the case of someone like Fisher or the Adam Brothers or whatever, who didn't go of imagining what the thing would be and the misfit between the imagination and the realization, for example, in terms of scale, could also be, in the, could result, lead to innovation in the case of Bath and it's scale very different than, let's say, the reality of what the origin would be. So I think, just sort of really supporting Michael's question, I think for us it's important to know what is the correlation between travel and now new forms of innovation. So like, if you see 5,000 of these kitchenless homes, like, what is the purpose of that in relation to a new a new discovery for architecture. It's not, it's not an affirmation pro program. It's a program of somehow discovery. So mm -hmm. it's, the same, mm -hmm. it's the same as Michael is asking, but I think it's just, it's much more black and white for us in some way. You go, you discover something, what are you going to bring? And we want the promise of the thing that you're, you're bringing back, not just the promise of the trip, but the promise of the speculation of mm -hmm. the fecundity of the trip like in terms of its architectural consequences. So what would you do? Okay, may I have a say? Um, <laughs> yeah. Well first of all, how 
how the observed is turned into action, into intervention, into a project matter. I would like to go back uh, to, to the example of Juan Downey's uh, intervention. Not, not exactly an intervention, a register. So mm -hmm. first, the register as an intervention, Juan Downey's work is so powerful that it has, it, it turns into uh, uh, its own life, I mean. Juan Downey's work uh, works um, is inspiring until nowadays because it was a register um, of, of a conceptuality so clear that it could be could be following be read could be read following by sorry could be read by the following generations in in different levels maybe and and through the the scope of time so first of all maybe one powerful thing that that. I think we all are planning to produce a set register that, that puts in a scope uh, a, a problem, and that register will be a product in itself. And, and, and the, second, uh, the second thing, more focused on intervention, uh, I think in the case of Anime Shogo, the, the big house of, of, of the forest, uh, that's a, a, an example of, of of an experience again with the, the work of Juan Downis, he he went to live among the Yanomami people, so he experienced himself, and experience experience yourself is a very powerful way to understand the place. Mm, when you when you can live with someone else that shows you the way that he lives, then you you you're brought to, to an understanding that it's different than than purely. Uh, purely registering or purely looking from outside, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the experience of an initial uh, was based on, on an experience in, in the elements of, of, the, of the place, and an, an experience of, of the way the, the Shibibo people inhabited the place. And, and yes, there were also some more brief experiences that I didn't want to include in, the, in my presentation because I think this Three are the more clear, the more developed, but there are also other experiences that we develop. For example, with our architecture students in the Pontificia Universidad Católica, we travel with them to the Ucayali River, and, and we we produce an intervention that uh, was aimed to test more specific features of culture, more specific features of the place, because it was a much more reduced experience. Mm -hmm. But in a way, it was a more clear experience because it was a conceptual exercise. So I think that kind of conceptual exercise could, could be a product of, of my research. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something that I'm, I'm willing to produce, and, 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 and it's a clear product of the, of the research mm -hmm. also. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, regarding the difference between observing and analyzing, I would say that it's always an act of synthesis. Uh, so, it's a selection, it's, a, it's never a description somehow. Um, so, what I tried to do in the recent past was actually to, to select what I wanted to, to then uh, give back to my public, be it that the user of my product or the reader of my book or uh, the inhabitant of my, my apartment. Um, Regarding uh, the topic I'm using, it's definitely, and what I want in, uh, I'm willing to, to get back is that definitely uh, the pluralization of the offer and of the cultural difference, uh, it's, uh, it's the main feature of this century. Uh, so dealing with complexity in terms of uh, uh, different offers um, in the same place, because the problem is that um, um, the cultural offers uh, is actually uh, mixed uh, and it's dense in one only context. Uh, it's necessary to produce uh, buildings in the future. So uh, changing the scale uh, from the house to the city, uh, it's definitely important to consider uh, cultural difference as a driving force of our spaces. And not only related to religion, which is the main driving force of my research, but actually uh, to any other kind of uh, intervention, because openness uh, should be given to any kind of uh, architectural production at the time. Too. Uh, yeah, I will start from what you what you say. Um, there's certainly an issue of 
quantity and quality uh, that I think is implicit in, in the same uh, concept of the seven wonders because it's kind of Guinness of records of antiquity and it can easily be just about what's the biggest and what's the most popular, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this, I think, is part of, the, of my interest. Why I think modern architecture was super elitist on this level. It tried to avoid as much as possible these popular, trashy things that, for instance, are completely um, accepted inside of Roman architecture. That is, at ease of it being pop architecture, and at the same time, super abstract. So I think the, uh, the issue of quality, like the, the capacity to somehow extract quality from this quantity, I think can only happen, honestly, I think only case by case. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I know, and, and I think in Fisher, uh, Fisher's collection, there is these uh, uh, confrontation of Fisher with the problem of quantity and quality in each different uh, case. And I think he does a relatively uh, good job. And, and I think it's going to be case by case, and it's a bit left to how things will develop also uh, with respect to what you were saying. That I, I think maybe it's uh, it's not really the smart answer that somebody who uh, might eventually get hundred thousand bucks uh, should give you, but I don't know what I eventually would do with my grand tour, and I think it's a bit the same thing that happened with the grand tour uh, with all these uh, architects of the past. If we if we look at uh, at the the drawing Schenkel made in his grand tour in Italy, there. They're completely different from what he would. It's not that they are not influential, but it's really not the. F he goes to it, he went to Italy and redraw a set of um, buildings uh, that you would really not associate to his later career. But nevertheless, they've been very important. There's all this incredibly picturesque the taste of the young uh, Schenker that is somehow surprising. But, uh, but for sure it had a, a, a consequence on, on that. So, um, Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah. when, when I was a student and we also got to study Schinkel, uh, we also got to study Fischer von Ella. I mean, the Fischer, um, there is something about the idea of the strangeness of things in Fischer. And then during that period, if I understood correctly, there was also the, pro the proposition of a kind of hybrid mixing of the strangeness of things as an architectural mm -hmm. project. Like, so the Vienna uh, church, the cathedral, mm -hmm. is precisely this kind of, uh, uh, that doesn't really fit within any kind of uh, obvious uh, stylistic, uh, condition. Therefore, it proposes this idea of the, of the imagination of the wonders as a way of creating now a kind of recombinatory idea of architecture, which is, you know, it's, it's made up of yeah. these strange pieces, which is a version of pluralism in some way. Pluralism is a representation of the acceptance of multiplicity of styles, for example. So that's a position which was somehow Suggested. And I think you are using representation very clearly in the stuff that you've done in Chicago. So I'm very, very curious, like, so what is the status of that in the, in the making of the project? And this is a longer, uh, longer discussion, but I think there is, a, there, is a, there, is a, there is a theoretical correlation between the visits and the new forms of imagination mm -hmm. that that enables, which I think is mm -hmm. yeah. what my group is asking. Yeah. Which is interesting. So, yeah. Anna, oh, no. We're running out of time. Right. 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 I'm going to also turn it to the audience. I want to get some more questions because we'll see you tonight, but but they won't. So you you answer and then I will have some questions. So I'm going to say.
Yes, uh, I'm going to answer Nassim first about the idea of the trip and the importance of uh, traveling for research and the production of architecture. I've, I've done a PhD. I've been eight years in an archive, so I've, I've done that. And uh, to do a project based on traveling, it's a completely other another basis. First, um, what someone mentioned, you, you can experience directly, and in my case, in the case of uh, systems, it's extremely important, because a system is not, you cannot understand it ant until it's used, and it demands a little bit of time as well to see how it breaks down, how to see frictions, and so on. And on the other, ha on the other hand, to have the opportunity to have a cross look worldwide, that's extraordinary. To put, it's not about visiting 5,000 it's not that. Just with one, I think that it's going to be enough. But to put that, the most peculiar one, next to another one, from another culture, another way of doing, I think that that's what the will right offers for the discipline. And, um, and I, I was really happy that you mentioned a, a, your, about your question about flexibility, because we are struggling right now with that in the office. Uh, for me, it's not. Flexibility is what we are communicating easily now, but it's not only about that. For instance, the Kitchen Timbers house was dependent. So an architecture that is dependent becomes flexible because mm -hmm. it needs another part. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore, it's something that goes beyond flexibility. Mm -hmm. So I do want to, where was it? <laughs> <laughs> I do want to turn to the, to the audience. And we can, well, I'm Italiano, we can speak Spanish, so. I'm one of the yes. <laughs> here. Just this time. Mm -hmm. this, is your, this is your chance. I have a question. I haven't completely worked it out of my head, so I might just talk through it. But in some ways, a lot of what you're proposing us out of in some ways challenging um, breaking codes or changing codes, you know? So I think it struck me when Mathilde was talking about um, these invisible spaces because in some ways, you know, it's a long process to get a kind of a approval for churches. And so, um, you know, it's very much a, a kind of, a, I don't want to say illegal um, settlements, but in some ways that's, that's what it's about. And, and with Samuel, um, and it would be about, I suppose, resisting codes or kind of improving codes to make um, these kinds of, you're dealing in the area of self-built, um, self-built community kind of architecture. So in some ways, it really is in defiance of codes. And, um, and sorry, I haven't thought this through completely. Well, yours is also, you know, codes where, you know, building codes where, um, what's the minimum requirements, I suppose, for domestic spaces? And how can you take out certain basic elements um, or amenities like kitchens and toilets and things like that? So, um, and architecture is all about codes. You know, architecture is all about constraints and, and you know, what, do archi what, are, what is expected of architects to provide at minimum in order to call a space whatever the space is. Um, so in some ways, the results, I suppose, of the influence your practice would really be putting your practices at the edge of changing how practice is happening or what you're, you know, what, what you're able to do. I don't know if that's something that you want to address or not. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, it's not completely thought through, but I'm going to read that's what I want. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. I started my research because there's a code in Spain that you cannot have an, an, a not continuous house. So your house has to be with a continuous surface. Mm -hmm. And that, for instance, um, it imitates a lot of in super interesting architecture. And it's not only about the kitchen, it's all about architecture itself. Mm -hmm. right? so, <laughs> so yeah, code matters. And we research to change code. And I suppose by collecting examples of ways to make this work, it could be a way for you to, again, in your own practice, say that it works and sort of push the ability for yourselves to be able to make these kinds of spaces that are not really, I suppose, allowed by a lot of what's happening in the cities. But I don't know. Okay. Yeah, uh, in my case, maybe it's also a sort of frustration uh, that things are happening anyways somehow, and, uh, and you have to follow them and try to detect them in order to digest them and produce spaces that are actually as flexible as uh, uh, the city uh, should be at the moment. So uh, mm, 
in this sense, research is really seminal in my, in my work because I really need to detect uh, these incredible systems that are actually uh, happening illegally and uh, without norms uh, also to update my knowledge and update the knowledge uh, mm -hmm. through architecture. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really, I feel it's really uh, important and necessary at the moment uh, to do this. Well, so one of the, just, just to, not to leave that, but just to modulate it a bit, it, it distracted me with the similarity between Attila's and, and Samuel's that in some ways both the, your, the communities that you were working with Matilda and the communities that um, in, in South America that they're they're using um, this idea of using existing things it's a kind of with with Matilda it's a kind of bricolage of having things available like you said everyone uses the IKEA bookshelf yeah. in a kind of bricolage but in a strange way in in the in the, in the uh, in the indigenous conditions that you were looking at, there's also using just what's what's available locally. So, and I'm wondering also, Samuel, your interest, one of your main interests, is how that kind of knowledge of indigenous cultures can be translated into different materials, different situations, and the similar thing. How do you take conditions that are how do you call it? Almost illegal, or yeah, semi uh, illegal, yeah, illegal. Yeah, uh, yeah some, somehow underground, and yeah. bring it into uh, the legitimate, but also limiting uh, conditions of, of contemporary production. Yeah. Yeah. But also, uh, I would I would add the the concept of a collective dynamic. I think that's a very powerful and important tool that is present in the traditional architectures and that we could look at as, um, as another way of, of approaching our discipline. Not from the project itself, not from the planification exactly. Well, it's a kind of planification, yes, but it's a collective dynamic held by a community. And that, in a way, um, let's say we're out of the codes, out of the room. But um, that um, constitutes a sort of collective collective codes that creates a coherent uh, creation of, of, a, of a collective space uh, of, of, of the quotidian activities and the, um, and the, the public void of, of, the, of the aggregations. Um, and when you built these, when you made these interventions in the, these local communities, you're still using similar materials, but there's, there was something different. How, how, does, how do modern techniques find their way in, or, or, or do they? You're, you're using local labor still, or is that also imported labor? Well, in your case, maybe it was students or, or you know, something. Is the labor the same? How does it change? Or the materials the same? How do they change? Um, in, the, in the case of Tarapacá, we used, uh, in the first place, our own labor, so it was uh, people that in theory knew how to build but never had touched a brick. So... The, you, like students. Yeah, yeah students, okay. ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, so yes, the, but the idea was to share yeah. with the community, was to make an example that they could replicate themselves. Right. So it, it should have been a project in the, in the measure of what the community can, can actually do. And, and, and so we took the constructed systems that were available in the place, not only as a remain of the past, but, but also the, the things that, the materials, the techniques that people were using actually to build their, their houses. Mm -hmm. And in the case of, of Peru, yes, we, we had, um, we worked with um, two groups of um, very skilled carpenters. They were Shibibo carpenters, um, and I had the, the opportunity of working with them, and, um, and I feel that it was important to be there, uh, to be there, um, especially in the case of Nihuinti, because this was sort of a new thing. Uh, the other, in the case of Anime Show, was something more uh, in the scope of what they had already already done, of what they knew. The, the shape and the speciality could have been different, but in the, the constructive form was something that they knew about. 
mm -hmm. but in the case of Nikuinti, this was an experiment, sort of an experiment. So it was important for me to be there, to encourage them to carry on, to not leave the thing at the first uh, difficulty. So, mm. so yes, uh, it's all things that has, had to be put in the scope of the of the local production of the of the of the communities. And this is something that we see all over the world in in the slums, in the peripheral uh, situation of cities, people building by themselves. And this is also a collective dynamic that that is nourished of the of the immediate, of the available. The only thing is that the available is expanded in this case, right. but um, mm -hmm. but it's something that we, we can mm -hmm. assume we, we could approach from the dynamics. Mm -hmm. So let me let me ask because I don't know how much. Uh, yeah, I know because many people I think do have class. But let me ask one. This is a difficult. This is a difficult question. Um, if you so if you win the wheel ride, you can travel. And and by the way, thank you for everyone presented a very clear itinerary. That was really really helpful to to some points along the way. Yeah. Um, because often we have to sort of squeeze out how, well how will how does that itinerary map on to the proposal? So that was it was very those were very good. So if you win the money, at least you can complete this itinerary. If you don't win, how will, what, what will continue? How will your research continue? What will, what will be different? Other, other than the travel, other than the travel, what will be different? How will the, you could, I, I could ask you, the, e the easy way around is asking it is how, how does the wheel ride change things? But it changes things because you, you have the money to travel and you have more time. You can take off maybe from teaching or working or whatever. You, you know, you have a kind of sabbatical maybe it, it allows. But if you, if you don't win, what, what happens? I've been to some of these places, like some of the places. I've been to Mount Rushmore, I've been to Lord uh, Fatima. Mm -hmm. Can imagine to slowly go to some of the others. Um, in a way, I think this would be important to um, to understand what where my research would be located. Somehow providing a context, but maybe I also think the the research then would be more. Um, made on books. I can imagine going to these places, seeing these places, and then eventually also give, doing nothing with that. Right. Because maybe the documentation of Lourdes and of Karbala, uh, maybe it's not necessary, and it's mm -hmm. more necessary for me to read Bakofen or Dumasil <laughs> and write about uh, Roman uh, <laughs> archaic uh, mm -hmm. Roman religion. Um, so, in, in this respect, I, I think, uh, um, for me, it will anyhow take time, mm -hmm. because uh, it's uh, uh, one, uh, it, it's a bit like the, the thing in Fisher. One thing is an investigation in space, in the contemporary reality, what happens, phenomena that I think have been a bit overlooked in architectural debate. But it's also an investigation in time, how we got to a uh, point of view on architecture that tends to forget certain things. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think I'm, I'm somehow on this track. I mean, uh, uh, I'm always wa will want to to keep on approaching uh, cultures and uh, to keep on working uh, directly with the people. Uh, it could be maybe somehow more difficult to um, to go to the, the area of the process of the collective process because that's something that nowadays somehow out of the scope of architecture. So if I don't win the wheel right then I will keep on um, 
developing these concerns, but more in the area of architectural project, and maybe more in the area of um, academic uh, research, and, mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think that's it. Mm -hmm. So I would say that uh, uh, my trial to understand the connection between the sacred ritual and architecture, up until now, um, I arrived to a certain level, which is the level was given me by my own capacities and my own, let's say, commissions. Uh, so uh, every, every step of the research were actually f the fruit of a commission or of a project. So somehow, um, the scale at which arrived is the scale probably of the interior. The step through architecture uh, would be necessarily uh, through uh, some more money because uh, it needs, first of all, um, a world tour, <laughs> as I want to do. And the world tour is necessary because multiculturality is necessary. So I really need the comparison among many different cultures and ways of living. So, um, so somehow I could continue my research uh, but a completely different scale, or it would be uh, somehow uh, not complete uh, because of, uh, of, of my, my resources and my, my conditions. It's really a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I, I think I'm, um, I'm going to do it anyway. I will find a way, uh, but there's a big difference. And I, I know that I will find a way because I, I arrived until here. I always find a way. So I get them to find yeah, a way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you find a way. <laughs> but um, what the big difference is that the Will Wright Prize offers you a, a platform of diffusion that at the end matters a lot in um, what we produce and we research. So it's not about if you do it or not. It's about who to who arrive mm -hmm. this thing. And uh, that's, the, mm -hmm. that's the big difference. So each of you, thank you so much. This has been a, a real treat for us. And uh, we have a little more time. We can loosen up a little bit <laughs> later. And uh, But thank you so much for your presentations and also for all your work that you bring here to, to show us. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.